Good morning. Will you please join in singing number one in the Purple Sing the Story songbook. Number one, praise the one who breaks the darkness. Please, if you're able, will you stand? Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. However you find yourself today and however you found your way here today, you are welcome at Portland Mennonite Church. There is much in our world that is broken. Uh, glaciers are vanishing. Whole ecosystems have been destroyed by war. And there are still far too many people without access to clean water. And we are broken too. We are sick, we are anxious, we are lonely, we are afraid. And we could hide from, or be ashamed of, or ignore our pain. But instead we gather today. We gather together because we believe that God can and does make things whole. Our seemingly simple acts of gathering and listening and giving and praying are radical signs of hope. Together as a community, it is um, easier to remember, we can remember, that God is the mender of all things. And together as a community, uh, it is safe to acknowledge that each of us has broken bits that we can't make whole on our own. We gather together to seek help and healing. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, maker of all that is and was and ever will be, we offer up ourselves to you. We offer you our hearts and our ears and our hands to hear what you have to say and to do what you call us to do together. Amen. Our next song is number 495, Morning Has Broken, in the uh, Voices Together songbook. This is not new to us. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, when I worked as a church youth director many years ago, um, I was also responsible for teaching the youth Sunday school class. And being a person of musical interest, I 
often played music and uh, spent time examining the lyrics to find what nuggets of truth we might learn from them. This song is one that I used, um, and so I recognize it from that time. Commercially, it's uh, performed with lots of orchestration. Uh, we can't do that here, of course. Um, I heard it several weeks ago at the Janet Snyder Memorial, and I thought then, knowing that my song leading time was coming due soon, I will use that again. So here we are this morning. Morning has broken. I recognize uh, Mei Wang on the violin. I wasn't able to get her name in the bulletin. One of the things I really enjoy, especially when I think I know when a song was written, is to look at the bottom of the hymnal and see how very old um, the tune or the words may have been. Um, so that was, it's always a little bit of a joy or a gift. It's time now um, for us to gather the offering. So I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. Um, and then we're going to say a quick prayer. I want to thank you all for continuing to, um, to give financially to um, help our church run and help our church help others in the community. Let's pray. Great big God, we offer you our gifts, our gifts of time, our gifts of money, um, because we know that there's more that needs doing that we, than we can individually do. So we offer this um, together, and we offer this to you um, for the good of the world, to bring peace and reconciliation in our city, um, and for the good of our own lives as well. Amen.
my name is Micah. I'm the guy with the baby in the back. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm part of the, short, uh, the small group committee here at PMC. So that's Gloria Nussbaum, Ken Roop, and uh, Caroline McCarthy. And over the last year, we've been working on kind of revitalizing and trying to kind of get small groups going again at PMC after COVID here. Um, this spring, many of you were part of short-term small groups. There was a farm day at the Flowers. There was a widow's group. There were some food card activities and a bunch of other things too. And I just want to say thanks a lot for those of you who led that, who initiated it, and those of you who just came along for the ride. That was really cool to see. Um, this fall, we're trying to take things to the next step and start some more longer-term small groups. Um, these are groups that will probably meet for a couple of years. Um, they'll meet anywhere from every week to every couple months. Though at the beginning, we recommend meeting every two weeks or so, so you can really kind of establish some rapport. Um, and if you miss a week, you're not totally out of the loop. Um, about, based on my back of the envelope calculation last night, about 40% of, of PMC is in a small group right now. So there's a lot of folks who, who don't have that sort of kind of deeper community outside of this building. Um, and that's what we're really looking to build up. Um, it's not just important for kind of building relationships across the church and having kind of those spaces for deeper sharing, but it's also really important for newcomers, right? So if you've only been to PMC a couple of times, maybe you've come to the service a couple of times, but you don't really know anybody, getting to be a part of a small group can be a really big deal. It can really kind of graft you into our community life. So that's what we're hoping to get started this fall. Um, you know, there will probably be kind of based on geography to some degree, so you don't have to drive too much. And what you actually do, I mean, it varies a lot by group. Some groups will kind of meet around a meal, maybe a potluck. Other groups maybe around a book or more, uh, maybe some spiritual practices. Um, but kind of no matter what the small group is, you really get to know people. <laughs> and you'll really kind of have that sense of community and deeper sharing. Um, yeah, so hoping to get that started. If you're interested in that, if you're interested in leading a, a small group or, you know, organizing, hosting, or just like coming to one, let us know. Um, I'll be in the back today with Ken at a little table back there, and we have some surveys that you can fill out on paper. There's also a survey on our website, which is the exact same, um, and came out in the bulletin this week in, in the email. Um, so if you fill out that survey, let us know where you live, what you're looking for, what would feel, you know, sustainable, life-giving to you, and we'll help, you know, get that set up this fall. If you're already a part of, of a small group, um, that's awesome. <laughs> keep, keep going with it. And if you want to be a part of a new one, too, you're welcome to do that, too, or even be a part of two at once. So we're really, really open to anything, <laughs> just uh, helping, hoping to get folks more connected to each other. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Micah. Um, now it is children's time with Joan. So we're going to get the quilt ready. And any uh, young people who are here or young at heart people who are here are welcome to come on down with Joan. I'm going to sit up here. good summer? Don't do that. Good. I'm having a lot of fun this summer. I hope you are too. You probably know that our theme for this for the summer, our church theme is water. And specifically today I think Kurt's going to talk about how we cross water. We can cross with or other or make other kinds of crossings. You know, we can use a bridge or a tunnel or a boat and but we're going to talk about crossings in general. Um, so I'm going to tell you a couple little stories about crossings, and then we'll, we'll figure out how that works for us. Now, my favorite kind of, of water is rain, and I really like r rain that's in a big storm, even though storms can be destructive, I know that. Um, where I grew up, I grew up all the way across the country in Virginia, um, real close to the other ocean, about 10 miles from the Atlantic, and where I live was really flat. It's just not even a hill, it's just flat. There was water everywhere. There were creeks and rivers and lakes and ponds and canals, and there was the ocean, and we had a lot of swamps. You know what a swamp is? Okay, so we had, we had a pond beside our house. We had a swamp across the road from us. And one of the storms we used to have when I was growing up that I thought was really exciting was a hurricane. Do you know what a hurricane is? Lots of wind, lots of heavy rain. Like you could look out the window, look like a toilet flushing. And, then, and um, when those big storms would come, 
there would also usually be a high tide in the ocean, and the, uh, that water would push up into the rivers and the creeks, and the rivers and creeks would push up into the swamps, and they would overflow. So I was about your age, probably, was, or maybe I was, I don't know, eight or nine. I remember, as kids, of course, when the storm was over, we liked to go out and run barefoot in, in the puddles. And so we went out, and we realized that on the road, going from the pond to the swamp, the water had overflown and was running about that deep across the road. So of course we wanted to run and play in that. And when we got out there, we discovered that there were fish swimming across the road. And we thought that was so cool that we were running through this water and fish were swimming around our feet. And those fish, and we also thought it was cool that the fish had found a crossing. They had found a bridge, but it was not over water, it was made of water. <laughs> Pretty smart for fish. The other story I want to tell you is one that you, you probably already know. It's a Bible story. It's from way, way back when the Israelites had been captured by the Egyptians and made into slaves. You know what a slave is? They had to work really hard and they couldn't leave. Well, eventually the Pharaoh, which is the king, decided he would let them go. And God chose Moses to um, take his people across the desert and find a new land where they could live safely. Well, don't you know, the Pharaoh changed his mind. He said to himself, wait a minute. Where is my head? I just let all the workers go. And he said to the army, go get them and bring them back. And by this time, the Israelites had gotten to the Red Sea, which is it's a huge inland sea, kind of like a gigantic lake. And there were no boats, and there were no, there's no bridge, no way to get across. And they can see that this army is coming after them, so they're kind of trapped. And what they didn't know was that God, of course, also knew what was going on. He called Moses aside and said, OK, Moses, here's how this is going to go down. You're going to hold your hand out. I'm going to part the waters. Got it? So when the people stuck God, they were really afraid, and they were really angry, and they went to Moses and said, what were you thinking? We were better off where we were. Now we're in all this danger. And Moses said, no, no worries. Here, hold my staff and watch this. And he held his arm out, and the water parted, and it left just a dry path through the Red Sea. The Red Sea was deep, and the water went straight up, and there was just this dry path. Do you think that would have been cool? <laughs> Me too. A little scary because that water probably went way up. And do you think that they could make see the fish swimming and maybe a snakes or turtles or whatever? I don't know. I think it would have been really, really fun and a little spooky. But the Israelites took advantage of it. They crossed on this dry path and God let the water crash back again. And they were safe. So that was another kind of, kind of bridge, kind of an upside down bridge, wasn't it? Not what we usually expect. And that's what we find in, in all of our lives. There are lots of times that we have to cross things. Maybe we cross water. Maybe we cross over a highway. Maybe we cross the street with a crosswalk. And sometimes we cross from things that are happening in our lives. Like you might cross from one grade level to another, or you might cross from a sad time in your life to a happier time in your life. There are lots of crossings in our lives. And what's really important to remember is that through all of those crossings, God will provide a bridge. There will always be a way to make that crossing. Thanks for being such good listeners. Let's say a quick prayer. Oh God, we are so grateful that even though sometimes we don't recognize the crossings, you always provide those for us. And we pray for these precious young souls and all the crossings that they will make in the years ahead. Amen. Thanks, guys. All right, so let us hear these words from the Old Testament story from Joshua 4, 19 to 24. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Those 12 stones which they had taken out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, saying to the Israelites, when your children ask their parents in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we crossed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. The word of the Lord.
Please turn to number 180 in the Voices Together. This is God's wondrous world. That phrase, repeat, is, uh, that phrase occurs six times in this hymn. It's a very familiar hymn. That phrase is different. Your memory will trick you as you go through the song. But remember, uh, the words are changed. This is God's wondrous world. Again, please, would you stand if you're able to sing? Now let us hear these words from the New Testament, from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. <clears throat> May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. If you're, uh, if you're newer to PMC, you may have noticed that we're a church with two very different modes. We have a summer mode and then a not summer mode. And uh, on the Sunday after Labor Day, this place is, always feels very different. Uh, summer mode will have ended and folks will be back from vacation. School will have begun. And this fall, we'll return to having Sunday school here at PMC again. And I'm looking forward to Sunday school. Uh, I'm looking forward to sitting with our high school kids and having discussions about faith. One of the biggest influences in my own life of faith has been hanging around teenagers. And here's why. For the most part, uh, adolescents don't put up with stuff that's fake. And uh, they have a unique way of sniffing out the spin. They question things. It's their superpower. Do you know how hard it is to, to write a sermon when they're the audience in, in your head? 
It's a lot of hitting the backspace muttering, you know that's not true. <laughs> so. But while we're talking about our teenagers, I might as well tell you that a significant number of them also have a small drug problem, meaning that the first choice on Sunday morning is not to come here. They are drug here by their parents. <laughs> so uh, I know that when I walk into that room upstairs on the first day of Sunday school this fall, not only am I going to be faced with people who are highly suspicious of all of this church faith stuff, but they probably don't want to be there in the first place. And you might think I'm painting a grim picture, and I would be, except for one thing. These kids are the funniest, the smartest, the most compassionate, and the most welcoming group of kids that you're ever going to meet. And if you doubt it, you can just ask Barry or Melissa or Bob or Deb or Don or Heidi, Stephen, Andrew, people that hang out with them. And they'll confirm that we have great kids here at PMC. So, on that first day of Sunday school, I plan to give a little speech, which is the same speech that I've given to our youth since I got here. I'm going to ask them if they are willing to create a space with me where we can trust each other enough to be our true selves. <clears throat> A place where we can be honest about what we think and feel about God. And we'll go over terms like atheist and agnostic to make space for those of us who want to be part of the conversation but don't want to be fake about where we're coming from. And I encourage the reality that these terms are like clothes. You can wear one moment and you can switch it out for something else in the next. Discovering our relationship to the God stuff is dynamic. It's not supposed to be a static decision. So, I hope that this is, in this spirit is, what, is how you hear my thoughts uh, this morning. This is not a sermon that gives the last word. Uh, it's a snapshot of my dynamic understanding of what it means to be a Jesus follower. This summer, we've been using the theme, Come to the Water. It comes from a summer worship resource provided by the denomination, and it explores a variety of texts uh, that have images of water in them. And the title given in the resource for today's service is Crossings, as you heard. And it uses a text from Joshua, which tells the story of the Israelites rallying around their new leader, Joshua after Moses dies and making the final push into the promised land. Once again, miraculously crossing through a body of water on dry ground, and this time the Jordan River. What sermon would you write with that as your text? Would you pick up on the themes of crossing from one place to another? Maybe talk about things we need to leave behind, things we need to take with us, uh, the hopes of, where, of what might be where we're going. There's images of building monuments with stones. Maybe you'd choose to talk about marking moments in your life that you're grateful for, or a time when you felt God was faithful. I suppose there's lots of ways you could craft a sermon about out of Joshua leading a group of wandering immigrants who've escaped oppression in Egypt, miraculously crossing a river with God's help and getting to the promised land. But I happened to reread the entire book of Joshua this week, and I can't bring myself to preach any of that. And I know that our teenagers would find it inappropriate for me to do so if they read Joshua with me. I grew up going to Sunday school and learning these stories. Maybe you did as well. I was taught as a child to identify with the people walking across Jordan's strangely dry riverbed, the benefactor of a miracle. I grew up learning deep down in my being that I, too, was part of God's chosen people. 
When later in the story, the trumpets were blown outside of Jericho, I was one of the marchers blowing my own trumpet. I was not on the other side of the wall. I don't remember one time in my childhood of anyone telling me this story from the vantage point of a child already living in Canaan, playing in the courtyard of her home, watching with wonderment and fear at the advancing Israelites. I was taught to ignore, to simply not think about the horrible, murderous, bloody story that unfolded for this child and everything that she loved. Here's the dilemma. As Anabaptists, we value the biblical text. I value the biblical text. But many of us these days confuse valuing the biblical text with biblicism. It's an approach which makes the Bible itself a sacred symbol or thing. Within this framework, readers will try to make every character in the Bible, in the biblical text, into a, into a spiritual hero, as long as they're written into the text as being on God's side. And preachers will twist themselves into knots to make sure that what the Bible is saying is something edifying. I don't think that as Anabaptists, this is a faithful way to read the biblical text. And this morning, I hope, I hope you'll hear me as I attempt to illustrate what I'm talking about. A guiding principle for Anabaptists has been that while we value the Bible, it must be read through the lens and the words and life of Jesus. And biblical interpretation must come from God's spirit working in community. Now we are, a, we are at a moment in our nation's history where Christian nationalism has become a loud and a clanging voice in our Twitter feeds and on the evening news. And I don't know how you process all of this, but for me there are many moments where I don't want to be called a Christian anymore because the baggage behind that identity has become so toxic. It can feel like what we're experiencing is a new rising phenomenon. But maybe it's just a very, very old struggle to understand the heart of God. In his book, Come Out My People, God's Call Out of Empire in the Bible and Beyond, West Howard Brook identifies this struggle and he gives it a name. Howard Brook helps us read the biblical text through new eyes and identifies what he calls two competing religions. The religion of creation and the religion of empire. He writes that the religion of creation is grounded in the experience of and the ongoing relationship with the creator God. A religion of creation is about having our human identity intertwined with a God that is a source of blessing and abundance for all people and all of creation. It's a religion that celebrates all of life. The religion of empire, on the other hand, claims to be grounded in that same God but it's actually a human invention used to justify attitudes and behaviors that provide blessing and abundance for some at the expense of others. It is a religion of greed and self-centeredness. Our text today sits inside a biblical story told firmly inside the religion of empire. Here's the way the book of Joshua opens. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place 
that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in the Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, to the west, shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the, all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. And then the story goes on. It goes on to imagine a God, imagine God as a warrior with the flaming sword who relishes in war and the complete, and if you read it, I mean complete extermination of his enemies. It is a foundational image of God. Yes, it's in the Bible. It is a foundational image of God for everything from the Crusades to the doctrine of discovery to the ideas of manifest destiny that lie at the birth of the state of Oregon itself. It is in the Proud Boys and the replacement theories of the white nationalists. It is in American exceptionalism and rhetoric that claims this country to be a city on a hill. It, f it feels like it's everywhere, it's because it is. We live in an empire, and the religion of empire is our first language. The sickness inside Christianity is empire. And let me tell you, our kids can smell it. And it's the primary reason that many of them want nothing to do with it. Now, it's tempting at a moment like this to place ourselves once again on the right side of this story. Yes, we know the world is full of bad ideas, evil ideas, but we're not part of that. That's not who we are. But let me ask you just a few questions from my own faith journey. Questions that I wrestle with from my own faith formation. And I ask you these questions because maybe some of them are relevant for you as well. What are your Sunday school answers to some of the following questions? Why do you want to become a Christian? The answer I grew up with was, because I want to go to heaven, and I don't want to go to hell. It's an answer that's infected by the religion of empire. It's self-serving. It's selfish. It saves me from punishment, and it gets me a reward. Why did Jesus die on the cross? My Sunday school answer was, he died to save me, from my sins. Did I learn that the answer was to save creation, to, to bring wholeness and shalom to all things? Eventually, but not in Sunday school. What was I taught about miracles? What did Jesus, why did Jesus feed the 5,000? Was it because people were hungry? I don't remember that being the answer. I remember it being that Jesus had superpowers and that he was my Jesus, and he lived in my heart. And that meant that my personal savior, Jesus Christ, was superior and powerful. And that superiority and that power could become part of my identity. What was I taught about non-believers? They were wrong. I was right. I was part of this small, chosen club, and I should look with pity, if not disdain, on those outside of the club. That's what I remember as a child from Sunday school. 
If we think realities like white supremacy and entitlement in our society isn't rooted in what we learned in Sunday school, I think we're being naive. And if we're going to talk about crossings this morning, it needs to be about leaving the religion of empire behind and planting ourselves firmly in the new ground of a religion of creation. Howard Brook makes the compelling case that Jesus was firmly planted in the religion of creation. The good news that Jesus was proclaiming wasn't a new idea, but rather a call to rediscover God's purpose. His life and words were often a rebuke to the stories in his own tradition where the religion of empire had distorted the true image of God. Jesus was rooted in an ancient purpose for humanity. Howard Brook puts it this way. Jesus was proclaiming that God's purpose was the bringing forth of a people whose lives would be a light for others to show them how to live in true harmony, to show them how to live in shalom with God, one another, and all of creation. Becoming a light that spreads shalom in a world that only knows empire is hard. It requires selflessness. It requires painful self-reflection and self-awareness. It requires compassion. And it requires a vision to know how things are supposed to be. But if we can create a space where we can be our true selves, where we can do this work together and not feel like we're doing it alone, then perhaps we'll discover that we have found joy and laughter along the way. Perhaps we'll discover we've made new friends. But thanks to a bunch of teenagers, <laughs> I know that's possible. So, may we all have enough faith, enough love, and enough hope for the journey. Because somehow, some way, I want to live on the other side. And I want you all to cross over there with me. Amen. Number 65 in Sing the Journey, the Green Book. Number 65.
part of this summer series on water, where I've asked several people to share a water story, to share about a body of water that's been significant to them, what it is and where it is, and uh, maybe even how it's fed their soul. And so Donna Kolowski is going to come and share a water story with us today. Good morning. Um, I've been at going to the church for 32 years. Some of you may not know that because I don't come very often lately, but um, I'm glad to be here this morning. When Rod asked me to send me an email asking if I'd talk about a body of water that's been significant in my life, without question or hesitation, um, it was the Nyanic River that came to mind. The Nyanic River is a five-mile tidal river in southeastern Connecticut that enters, empties into the Long Island Sound, around which my first 20 or so years revolved. After my family and my Newfoundland dog, I can't think of anything that mattered more to me as a child. The Nyanic River was the world as far as I was concerned. It was in this salty water that I learned to swim, to fish, to crab and scallop, I skated on the Nyanic River in the winter, which was risky business because with the tidal river, you had to leap over the first three feet or so of slushy ice where the tides came in and out. And more than one time I went home with my pants and socks and body frozen stiff. Um, I didn't, okay, whoops. I learned how to sail in the, in the summer. We had a sailfish and I loved to go zooming across um, the river. In the winter, the neighbors made ice boats, uh, sailboats. I would just put wood and skates underneath and a sail, and that was a blast. I've never seen it since, um, but that was a lot of fun. I learned how to water ski, and I was a champion swimmer <laughs> in my neighborhood. We had about maybe 200 um, people in our neighborhood, and every Labor Day we'd have a festivities where we had races, and I always seemed to win the swimming race and the diving competition with my front flip. Um, I got married. I married another eight-year-old by yelling our vows across the channel between our two neighborhoods. Gratefully, this marriage lasted about a week. Um, it was Wayne, my Cracker Jack ring spouse of that one week in spring of 1968, subsequently has had many run-ins with the law, from what I understand. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. The water from the Nyanic River seeped into my bones, and every time I return home and I smell that seaweed-scented air, I'm transported back to my youth. It's a feeling of both calm and exhilaration. But my favorite activity for all those years was fishing. When I was really young, say four or five years old, I fished with a drop line, which is just about five yards of line wrapped around a piece of wood, at the end of which you hung a hook and a sinker. And um, my, my drop line was fancy. It was painted red, and it was shaped like a fish, and I was quite proud of that, <laughs> that drop line. But we'd sit, usually my mom and I, which is kind of unusual, in the boat listening to the waves and the gulls and turns and wait for a nibble. Flounder was our goal, but often it was just a bait-stealing cunner that either we fed to the seagull, if you'd chuck it up and they'd catch it in the air, which was fun, or you bring it home for the cats because it was too bony for human consumption. But I developed a love for quiet and wonder and the ability to observe as I sat there in, the Boston, in our Boston Wheeler for hours. I didn't tire of it, even when we weren't catching. I'm sure it's a bit odd in those days for a girl to be out on the water like that, cutting the sandworms into pieces, baiting the hook, and then washing worm blood off my hands in the cold water. Not only was I required to bait my hook if I wanted to fish, but I also had to remove the fish from the hook. And uh, my brothers used to tell me, the fish is crying. And it, <laughs> I can still think of it. I would say, I'm sorry. <laughs> my only reprieve was I didn't have to clean or fillet those. My mom did that. I like that Jesus seemed to be a water person like I was. God was a scary guy to me. Um, who was always watching to make sure, you know, to see if I slipped up. But Jesus, Jesus is more approachable. I like that he chose fishermen to be his disciples. I, he retreated in a boat when he heard the awful news that his cousin 
had been beheaded. He preached from a boat because probably the acoustics of the water made it much easier for the crowd to hear him. He slept in a boat during a storm and he even walked on water. That's something I'd like to learn how to do. <laughs> there was a popular song in youth groups in the 1970s whose refrain went something like this. And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. That song really resonated with me as an adolescent. Now I don't have the Nyanic River, but I do have, I do live about a half mile from the Columbia River, and our neighborhood walking trail runs along a slough where I can admire the ducks and the herons, the kingfishers, and the occasional otter. It too brings calm and exhilaration. Water makes me sing, and when I sing, I tend to sing hymns, because more than any other genre of music, that's, the, that's what seems appropriate when I'm by the water. I'm grateful to have grown up where I did and to have cultivated a love for what our Creator gifted us with. It's worth protecting. Thank you, Donna. Water is a part of all of our lives, and so uh, this summer, we're encouraging everyone when you're out and about to, to collect a sample of water. Maybe your travels will take you far and wide, or maybe it's just uh, water from the tea kettle you use every morning to make your tea or your coffee. But we're going to gather all those together at uh, Wildwood, gather all those waters, and gather with them the stories uh, that we bring with us. Um, in response to the sermon, in response to this series, Come to the Water, um, if you have uh, something you'd like to share with the congregation, uh, we have time now for talking and listening to one another. So we invite you to stand in the ushers and bring a mic. Or if you have a special uh, concern that you'd like us to hold in prayer or expression of thanksgiving, we invite you to stand as well. We're going to continue to stream this service. Uh, to this point in the summer, we had been uh, stopping the stream to YouTube, but uh, for the sake of the online congregation, being more fully a part of our community life, we're gonna to continue to stream uh, this part of the service. And for those of you online, if you have something you wanna share, we're gonna try something. We'll see if it works or not. Ryan's gonna post my cell phone number. So text me and uh, I will share your concern with the congregation and uh, we'll see if we can redeem technology or not. Um, I do invite your prayers for Marvin Friesen. Uh, Marv, um, well, I won't read it, but Marv uh, was back in the hospital this week. On Wednesday, he had a procedure to address the pain in his back from a broken vertebrae. Uh, apparently, it went well. He has less pain now. And when they can find a spot, they're going to release him to a nursing, uh, skilled nursing care facility for rehab. So for Marvin, um, hold him in your prayers. And after the service, Linda Winning, who's one of our elders, will be available up front if you'd like to talk with someone. You can come on down after the service. So any responses, requests? Hello guys, uh, my name is Ryan Appleberry. I'm back here. Hey, I just wanna go ahead and give a little update on Brandon. Brandon, of course, is my 19 year old son. Um, we have completely and totally finished chemotherapy. He had received 21 uh, chemo infusions. Uh, we are in now the six week waiting period to see if the chemo is doing its job, if it's shrinking the interdominal tumors that he had and things like that. So um, I just want to say God is good, God is great. Um, and also thank you all for your thoughts and prayers. Um, Brandon is doing very, very well. Uh, he just completed his second week of back to work. He is a package handler for FedEx, so <laughs> he has a uh, a lot of pain in his in his hands and things like that and we are told that, that is basically from the chemo so um again your thoughts and prayers are always greatly appreciated and thank you so much appreciate it wow thanks for the update ryan uh let's see in the back and then we'll come up to mary so hi Kim. sorry um actually this is hard to take off so i'll leave it on just an update and i appreciate that your prayers for uh, our little guy Connor, uh, my dear friend Susan Elizabeth's uh, family member, and he is um, now in um, Seattle in chemo and radiation, I believe. Uh, I haven't heard an update since that really got underway, but I'd appreciate your ongoing prayers for uh, six-year-old Connor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, Mary, uh, when you're up front here. Thank you. 
I just want to thank Kurt for that very thought-provoking sermon. Um, and it reminded me of an article that I read a few months ago in um, the Anabaptist world by Jim Brenneman. He wrote a very, um, very thoughtful essay about not calling ourselves Christian, but calling ourselves Christ followers. And um, that came to me while you were speaking this morning. Uh, I think that it would be worth anybody's time to look that article up and read it, but thank you for challenging us. Anyone else? Well, let us gather up our concerns then, our gratitude, and offer them to God in prayer, and we'll finish by saying together the Lord's Prayer. God, some of us come uh, today with hearts uh, full of gratitude. We've been eating fresh berries. We've had a chance to connect with family or vacation with friends. Uh, we've seen the wonders of your handiwork, maybe the Pacific coastline or the high Cascades. We felt your peace pressed into our hearts. And some of us come worried about people we love or bearing grief facing big decisions and not knowing what to do. Especially this morning, we're mindful of Marvin, and Brandon, and Connor. And all of us, all of us long for a city, for a world of less gun violence, warfare, racial inequities, and more understanding, more mercy, more justice. So we pray that your spirit, the spirit of creation, the spirit that Jesus promised, will work in and around and among and through us and throughout the world to heal what's broken, and to right what's wrong, and to expand our capacity to love one another as you've loved us all. And now we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, as we finish here now, uh, please do note the uh, announcements that are printed in the bulletin or that you can find online on our webpage. Um, remember, small group survey in the back. Um, it's a, a vital way to make connections in our congregation, so I hope you can become part of a small group. There's also a sign up in the back for Family Promise. Uh, we're part of an emerging consortium of churches that's going to house families who are experiencing homelessness. We're going to take four weeks out of the year, and then other churches take four weeks. Our first week is September 25 and following. If you want to be part of um, actively interacting with folks who are staying here, you have to do a training. It's two and a half hours. The next one is going to be here uh, next Sunday, July 31st at uh, 1045. You can sign up in the back, and then there's some other dates. Uh, but please, um, I hope you all can be part of that. Um, next Sunday evening, we're going to have a memorial service here at 5.30 for uh, Galen Nussbaum. And then uh, also on August 14th, we're going to have an evening uh, hymn sing, a chance to explore more this new worship book we have, uh, Voices Together. So, I hope you can find your place in the life of our congregation. Our sending hymn today is from, uh, from Voices Together, number eight, 844, May the Face of God Shine on You. So, Jim.
Let's go from here into the world that God has created. Let us go from here to love and serve. Go in peace. Amen.